this clarifies a little bit what we are uh, trying to do. Now, if, if I was, for any particular system, able to find the H, the impulse response of that system, and you ask me as an engineer to calculate or predict what's going to be the output for a particular given input, I would simply apply the convolution expression. So you tell me, for example, you have this system, and the impulse response of that system is given by this equation in time, a function of time, right? And tell me what's going to be the output if the input to this system is, for example, an exponential with a certain form. I will just take that exponential, plug it here. I will just take that impulse response, plug it here, apply the convolution integral, solve this, and the result is going to be the output from that system for that given input, OK? <clears throat> now, again, typically this operation is represented by a shorthand saying x of t convolved with h of t, OK? So that integral with two functions multiplied together, one of them as is, the other one is shifted and reversed and so on, right? This whole process is called the convolution process. And you can think of it as an operation between two functions. It can be any two functions, x1 and x2, x and h, whatever. It has a physical meaning when we are talking about impulse response and input because it represents the output from that system. But in some other applications, it might have two signals convolved together because you want to get something else. It has nothing to do with this course or signal in the system. So the convolution by itself is a mathematical operation that can be applied between any two functions. Okay? It's an operation between functions, not variables. So when we say, for example, 3 plus 2, this is an operation between variables. right? But when we say x of t convolved with y of t or with h of t, or x1 of t convolved with x2 of t, that's an operation between two functions of time. Okay? That operation by itself, like any other mathematical operation, has its own property. Remember when you studied in your earlier, very, very early math, like in, in the schooling system and so on, right? Maybe prep school, uh, last few years of like grade five, grade four of, of uh, primary school. You studied, for example, addition and subtractions as operations, and then you were taught that addition is commutative. So 3 plus 2 is the same as 2 plus 3, right? And then you studied after that multiplication, and you started doing something called distributive. If you have 3 multiplied by 2 plus 1, this is the same as multiplying 3 by 1, and multiplying 3 by 2, and then adding the results, right? So similarly here, we have properties for the convolution as an operation between two functions, OK? The first property is convolution is commutative. So if you take the convolution of x with y or x1 with x2, it's the same as doing x2 with x1, OK? Uh, this is very useful because sometimes in that mathematical expression of the integration, it might be much easier for one of the functions to be the one with the t minus tau and the other one to be with the tau only, right? Because the one with the tau is typically simpler. So if you have a very complicated function, it's better to keep it with the tau, and the simpler one is the one that becomes with the t minus tau. It doesn't matter. You can do that or this, because uh, x uh, convolved with h is the same as h convolved with x, OK? So that's the first property. It's commutative, uh, commutative sorry, OK? The second property is uh, it's also distributive. So if you take the convolution of some function, x1 of t, and you convolve that with the summation of two functions, x2 and x3, that's the same as convolving with the first, convolving with the second, and then adding the results together. Okay? This is called distributive property. The third one is associative as well. So if you take the convolution of x1, and you convolve that with the result of the convolution of x2 with x3, so you calculate this first, and then you take the result and you convolve it with this, it's the same as doing x1 with x2 first, and then taking the result and convolving it with the third. We call that the associative property, OK? I'll give you an example of operations that some of these properties do not apply to. For example, matrix multiplication, right? When you multiply two matrices, x times y is not the same as y times x. They give you different results, right? Okay? So it's not always true for any operation that we do. That's why we stress 
that these properties apply to the convolution, okay? Uh, another property specific to uh, operations between functions is called the shift property. If you have x1 convolved with x2, and the result of that is something called c of t, so that's the result of the convolution, that's the result of that integral when you calculate it, right? It gives you some function of time c of t. Then if you do the convolution of one of those with the other shifted, so x1 kept as is, while x2 is shifted by capital T, or x1 is shifted by capital T and x2 is kept as is, the result is going to be the same as the original result without any shift, but shifted with the exact same time. Okay? What if both of them have shifts? Then you can expect that the result, which is true, the result is going to be C of T minus the first shift minus the second shift. So it will be both shifts are going to affect the output. Okay? Okay. Another important thing is called the unity property. Uh, remember, for example, for addition and multiplication, you have a unity uh, element, right? If you add anything to zero, you get the same number. Right? X plus zero is the same as X. And X times one is the same as X. So we call one the unity um, uh, for uh, multiplication, and zero is the unity for addition. Here, for convolution, the unity is delta. If you take any function and you perform a convolution with that function, with the delta function, you get the same function again. So X, any function X convolved with delta, you get back the X. Nothing happens, right? So the delta is the unity uh, for the um, uh, for the unity for the uh, convolution operation. Okay. Last but not least, this is a very useful property. Uh, it's called the wet property. If you take the convolution of two functions x1 and x2, and both of them have finite duration, so this one has a finite duration t1, it starts at some point and then finishes at another point. That the distance between those two is t1. And the other one is also finite duration, so it starts at certain time, finishes at certain time, and the distance between them is t2. The convolution of those two is going to be a function which is also finite in time, and the total duration of that function is going to be the sum of those two durations. This is useful in terms of two things. Number one, when you are calculating the convolution, you know where to stop, right? I have covered this whole range. I don't need to really to go beyond that. Right, if, I, if I'm already trying to calculate that convolution integral, and I was able to find its value across a whole range of t1 plus t2 for those for the convolution of those two finite functions, and that's it. I, I should stop there. The other thing is when you solve the convolution, and if you find that your solution does not correspond to this property, you know what's x1, you know what's x2, you look them up, you, sh you know that the convolution should be, for example, of duration 3 seconds. You find that your convolution is only of duration one second, or it's of duration 10 seconds, then you, you know that you did some mistake. So it's nice to use as a checkpoint whether you did your calculations correctly or not, okay? <coughs> Any question about those properties? Yes. Um, is it like x of t multiplied by uh, x1 with x2 equal to zero? Just There's no multiplication here. There is convolution. The star is convolution operation. I know that sometimes MATLAB uses star for multiplication, but here, or in the textbook, or in most of the uh, books that talks about signals, or even math, the star means the convolution operation. Go ahead, yes. Um, we don't add the, the height, we just add the width? Uh, no, the height is calculated from the whole integration operation. So the value of the convolution, right, is going to be calculated from solving that integral, which is going to give you some function of time, right? The only thing is you should know that this function of time, if the two functions that you have been convolving are of finite duration, then this function of time, the shape of it, should finish on the x-axis within a range equal to... So we don't care about that. The, not we don't care. We do calculate it and we care about it, but it has nothing to do with this property. This property says that the duration of the non-zero values of the function should be also the sum of those two durations, okay? But the value itself comes from solving that integral, right? Yeah. Any other questions? Fine. We will solve an example on convolution for two purposes. The first purpose of this is just to try the operation ourselves. 
And the second purpose is we will learn something very important when we solve this example, and then the next few slides are going to focus on that important thing that we will learn. Okay? So let's look at this problem. The problem says that you have a linear time invariant system. The input to that system is given by some exponential function. All good? Okay. So the input to that system is an exponential function, but it only exists on the positive side. So exponential multiplied by unit step of t. Okay. And the impulse response of that system, h of t, is given, in this case, it's also an exponential with a different exponent, and it also exists only on the positive side. So this is how x of t looks like. This is how h of t looks like. Okay. And the question is, find the output. So for any linear time invariant system, if this is the input and this is the impulse response, what's the output? Aywa, x of tau, low input, h of t minus tau, d tau. That's, or you can simply write this as x of t convolved with h of t. The same thing. When we write it this way, we just say that we are going to perform the convolution operation, and then this convolution operation translates into this integral with those uh, shifts and... Uh, and other things, <laughs> okay? I will mention those other things. So, anyways, if I want to do that, this is x of tau, not zero, huh? Looks like zero, it's x of tau. x of tau, h of t minus tau, okay? So let's try to do this. Let's try to solve this integral, right? So what does it say? It says that, again, just note that here in this integral, we use the time variable, we call it tau, dummy variable, we call it tau. And then we use another time variable t inside, which is going to be the time variable of the output, right? The output is going to be a function of this t guy, right? But the functions inside the integral are all a function of tau, the dummy variable that we use, okay? So when we want to draw those functions in order to, to draw, like to sketch them, in order to perform the multiplication and figure out what's the expression here, we have to sketch them versus tau because that's their actual time variable that we use for the integration, okay? Okay, so let's see how x of tau would look like. This is tau and this is x of tau. If this is x of t, then x of tau is going to look like what? Same thing, right? Just the same graph. I just called the t tau, nothing else, okay? So this is how it would look like. It will start from 1 and it will go down, okay? And it's going to be an expression e to the minus tau, okay? Everyone agrees? Okay. Now let's look at what do we have here? As a function of tau, it's a reversed function because we have h of minus tau, right? But not only that, it's shifted with some constant. It's constant with respect to the integration, right? It doesn't have any effect on the integration, right? So it's shifted with some constant called t, right? So first of all, when I reverse h, it would look like this. If I re if just time reversing it, this is h of minus tau, right? This is tau. What I want here is actually h of t. Oh, sorry, h of. Okay. So the, 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 the one that I see now dotted is just h of minus tau. That's the time reversed version of h of t, right? Why I'm doing this? Because what I want to get is this, which has minus tau. It's a function of minus tau, not tau. So it should be flipped, time reversed function. And now I need to shift it by a value t, right? So if I shift this function by a value t, Again, if t is positive, it will look like this, right? And if t is negative, it will look like this, right? And the end point here, or the end point here is going to be what? What's going to be the time value? Exactly. It's the small t, right? So this is going to be the t, the t, okay? 
here, because it used to be zero. And then I shifted with value t. If t is positive, it's going to go this way, and it will finish at t. If t is negative, it's going to go this way, and it will finish also at t, whatever the value of t is, positive or negative. OK, so let's look now at what will happen. Okay. If I use a negative value of t, so for t smaller than 0, which is the case of the blue line, right? When you want to perform the operation of multiplying x of tau with h of t minus tau, this is h of t minus tau for the case of negative value of t, right? When you multiply those two functions, what will you get? Zero, because this is multiplied by nothing here, right? And this is multiplied by nothing here. So the result of the multiplication is going to be zero, right? So for t smaller than zero, for any negative shift, the result of the multiplication here is zero, which means that the result of the integral is zero, because that's a, like a limit integral, right? Can we change the boundary? Can we change the boundaries? No, no, we'll not change the boundaries. In, in general, for any t smaller than 0, this whole integral is equal to 0. We're not changing any boundaries yet. Okay? So that's the ca first case. If t is smaller than 0, the value y of t corresponding y of t is equal to 0. Right? Because the value of the integration, the value of the convolution is equal to 0. Okay. Let's start now saying, okay, it becomes... 0, and then it becomes positive. In the positive case, right, what's going to be the value of the integral? First of all, where this multiplication is going to be non-zero? Only in this range, right, from this point up to this point, right? Outside this range, whatever is here is multiplied by 0 here, and whatever is here is multiplied by 0 here. So only in the range between the two green lines, right, you will have some value multiplied by some value, right? This means that our integral from minus infinity to infinity of those two terms, this is what we are considering right now, is the case of t greater than or equal to 0, right? y of t is going to be equal to what? Let's see, okay? It's going to be equal to an integral of the multiplication of the two functions. The multiplication of the two functions, we just found that it will have non-zero value only in this range. So the integral should be only within this range. Outside the range, it will give zero, right? So what is the limit of those two points? From zero to t, right? And what's inside? What's this function? e to the minus tau. Right? And what's the second function, this one? Hmm. E to the minus 2, huh? T minus tau. We replace every T by T minus tau. Right? And then we integrate with respect to? Our integration is always with respect to tau. Right? So now I have the function. I just need to multiply those and solve the integral, and the result is going to be what you see here, the black line that you see here, okay? which will have this expression, e to the minus t minus e to the minus 2t. Okay? Okay. So the idea here was, I mean, again, the result of all this operation is that you are going to write eventually y of t is equal to 0 if t is smaller than 0, and it's going to be equal to e to the minus t minus e to the minus 2t, right? Um, uh, if t is greater than or equal to 0, right? Which is this function that you see here, which, again, this expression comes, comes from solving this integral. Yeah, this is this thing 
is only possible when t is greater than zero. I'm multiplying this with the upper No, one. notice that sum is negative, so it doesn't like shift to the... Yeah, but isn't the blue one for... What do you mean by the blue one? This one? Yeah, the this is tau. for negative t. Shouldn't that be for positive? No, it's minus tau, yeah. and then t. Plus t, so you, you don't have a negative way. No. Minus tau, negative. remember, we said you shift to the right if the two signs are the same. You shift to the left, if the two signs are opposite to each other, right? In both cases, I'm going to write it in general as t minus 10. That's the general expression, OK? If the t is negative, the shift is going to happen in this direction. Because the t will have the same sign as the tau. And if the t is positive, then the shift is going to happen in that direction, because the t is positive and the tau is negative, right? OK? Any other questions? Okay. طيب. Uh, before discussing this slide, so the most important thing that we come up with from the previous slide is that when we are performing the convolution operation, we have to always imagine this picture of one of the functions being flipped, right? One of the functions stays as is, the other one flipped and then shifted across with different values of t. As we change the value of t, one function, which is the flipped one, moves across the other one. At any location for the value of t, right, the result of the convolution and that value of t is going to be the multiplication of those two functions and then integrating the result of the multiplication. Okay? Then for another value of t, move a little bit more multiply the two functions, and then calculate the integral of that multiplication, and so on, right? But always keep in mind that one function is reversed and shifted, and it slides across the other, okay? At some point, you will have no, inter no like, no inter, uh, what do you call it? No overlap between the two functions. At some point, you might have partial overlap, at some point, full overlap, and then at some other point, half partial overlap, and then maybe at some point, no overlap again, right? Depends on how each function looks like. And this becomes a little bit more challenging, but very important to keep it in mind when the two functions are piecewise continuous, or when one of them is piecewise continuous. Like, it has a value, and then it has a sudden change to another value, and then it has a sudden change to a third value, and so on. Because now, you cannot just consider, like what we did here, only three cases, like, uh, uh, sorry, here only two cases, right? Uh, one case, no overlap, and one case, there is some overlap, and that's it, right? And it stays the same forever. In that case, you will have, in the overlaps themselves, is it overlapping only with one piece, or with two pieces, or with more pieces of the function? Because for each change in the value, the expression inside the integral is going to change. So you cannot keep the same integration expression valid for any shift of t, okay? We will see that when we solve a really complicated example uh, in a couple of slides. But before going to that complicated example, uh, there is one important note, and this is why I have this slide here. And this refers also to why did we have a slide discussing the properties or the important properties of convolution. In many cases, we know the results of convolution for certain famous widely used functions. And they are tabulated, they are listed to us in tables, okay? Uh, but they are listed in the tables for a general expression of the function. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Using these tables and the properties of convolution, we can actually find many convolutions between two functions without going back to solving integration. We just look it up in the table and maybe need to apply some properties to be able to use the values in the table, and accordingly, we can find the convolution directly without really doing anything in terms of integrating or wasting time calculating the convolution. Let me give you an example, okay? And the example is going to be very simple, but I think it will demonstrate what I mean. 
Let's look at this particular property. That's one example, okay? So here it says, sorry, not property, this particular famous convolution. Uh, ah, that's, okay, let's use a simpler one, this one. Okay? So it says that if you want to do the convolution of T, T to the power M, multiply it by unit step of T, convolved with the other one, T to some other power N, multiply it by unit step of T. If you want to do this operation, the result is going to take this general form, which you can get its final expression by simply substituting the value of M and N, right? The power of the T in the first term of the convolution and the power of the T in the second term of the convolution. Imagine that your question was a simple one. So it says find the convolution of t to the power 3, unit step of t, convolved with t, unit step of t. You will tell me, OK, I will apply this formula, because this looks exactly in the form t to the power m unit step multiplied by t to the power n unit step, right? And if I apply that formula, then this must be equal to m is equal to 3, and n is equal to 1, right? This is m, for example, and this is n, the power here. So if I apply this to the formula, I have 3 factorial times 1 factorial divided by 3 plus 1 plus 1, all of that factorial, and then t to the power m, which is 3, plus n, which is 1, plus 1, and then the whole thing is multiplied by unit step of t, right? And you can simplify this, so you'll get factorial 3 divided by factorial 5, uh, t to the power 5, unit step of t. And voila, you have the convolution of those two functions without really going to any integration of anything. Simply, you found them in the table, right? Yes? No, 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 at all. Okay. Don't worry. Okay? Okay. So the question is, okay, that might happen, but what if I get something slightly varied? And let me give you an example. So someone comes to you and says, oh, try to find this for me. T minus 1 to the power 3 multiplied by unit step of T convolved with T multiplied by unit step of T. What's the convolution here? Then you look at this and you say, well, it still looks like those guys, but the problem is I have, sorry, there is one catch here, so to make it simpler, <coughs> this can still be solved, but that's more complicated, so it's too advanced for us. Let me simplify it. T minus one. Okay? Convolved with the other one. And then it looks like one of the famous ones that exists in the table, but there is this t minus 1 thing which is not really there. So what should I do? Should I just try to expand that or do what? And then you remember, oh, there is a property that tells me if I know that convolution, right? because this, if I look at this one, if I look at this one, it looks exactly like this one, but the only difference is the time is shifted by one, right? Unit step of t minus one, and this is also shifted by one. And there is a property that tells me if I know the result of this convolution, and then I perform a convolution where one of the two functions was shifted, the resulting is going to be the same result, but with the same shift, right? So you go and apply that property in order to figure out the solution. So you would tell me, okay, this is the same as this convolution, which can be deduced from the table, and we can get for it this expression. The only difference is here, I have a shift by one for the time for one of the functions, for one of the two functions, right? Then the result here should have, for this one, the result, instead of the result that we have here for the one without shift, the result for this should be the same like this, but only the t and the t are shifted by one as well. So you would tell me immediately that using the shift property, this is equal to factorial three over factorial five, 
t minus 1 to the power 5 unit step of t minus 1. Right? Again, I gave a very simple example. Sometimes it might be more than one property. Sometimes to figure out the property that you need to use and the terms that you need to use, you need to manipulate the question given to you somehow. But again, the idea is clear from what I said here. I mean, getting to solve a more complicated ones is only done by practicing on doing that, okay? And the other one was uh, U of T, by T, U of T. It was shifted by two, so it can be T minus one minus two. So if you mean here, for example, yeah. this one yeah. was what, T minus two? Yeah. Unit step of T minus two? Then it would have been T minus three. So T minus one minus two. As I mentioned earlier, if both functions have shifts, you just take those shifts and you, you combine them, add them together with their signs, so positive or negative, okay? Do we assume T is always positive in this case? We are not assuming anything about T here. This is a general expression for any T. For any T? For any T. This is valid for any value of T. But you have UT in all the functions. Again, UT guarantees that the function will not have a zero value outside a certain range, right? But it doesn't mean that t itself is always, that t can take any value, but the function itself exists in a certain range. I mean, again, if you look at this one, it's no longer only in the positive side, right? This starts actually at minus one. So t can take negative values and you still have a non-zero value for the function, okay? Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Based on what we have discussed so far about the convolution and the fact that when you are calculating that convolution integral, you need to keep in mind what happens to one of the functions and what happens to the other and how one of them is sliding over the other one. Um, we have this concept of always trying to graphically imagine how the convolution happens in order for you to be able eventually to calculate mathematically the result of a convolution, right? And if we look at the process that we did so far, it can be simplified in these steps that you see here. Again, the steps are not different from what I mentioned, uh, but when we start from the next slide, applying this to an actual calculation, you will see the real value of imagining what's going on, okay? So it says that when you have the convolution of x of t, when you want to calculate the convolution of x of t convolved with some h of t, then typically, in, in this case, that's the integral, and x stays as is, while h is the one which is time-reversed and unshifted, right? So keep the x fixed, it just stays as is, right? And then start now thinking about the other function as being flipped, and shifted with a certain value. And all what you have to do is look for what will happen as the value of the shift changes, right? What will happen to affect what? To affect the result of the convolution. What is the result of the convolution? It's the integration of the product of the overlapping components of the two functions, right? So for example, when we had this situation, right? One function and the other function is like this, and then the overlap only happens in this range, right? And you have now to multiply the functions in this range and then integrate the result of the multiplication, right? So that's what gives you the convolution and then repeat the same operation for other different values of t, the shift value, until you are finished with all the range of t, not tau. Tau, of course, you cover from minus the to the but you need also to consider all possible shifts until you see that things are no longer different, okay? You stop at that point, okay? We'll see that when we uh, perform uh, an example on this. The, I used to give a different website uh, for this. There was a website on John Hopkins University. It was really nice. It has very nice animation for the convolution. But uh, last time I gave this course was 2017. I tried the website. Uh, at the start of this semester, it still uses Java. It used Java applets, Java on websites. And unfortunately, almost 100% of the browsers that we have nowadays, they block Java because Java on HTML is quite unsafe. So if you go to the website, all the text descriptions is nice, 
but if you try to look for the animation, it's just a gray box. Nothing is running there, right? So I found an alternative site. It doesn't really, I mean, try, I tried to find very similar alternative. I couldn't. If you find something, you can share it with the group. I found this one, uh, which is, I mean, sufficient. It allows you to slide uh, the function, and then as you slide it back and forth, it shows you what's going to happen with the result of the convolution, where is the overlap area, and so on. But I still, if I have to vote, I would vote for the John Hopkins one, but uh, it's no longer working. So anyways, you can check that website. It will like help you visualize uh, how the convolution operation occurs. Uh, but more uh, here in the classroom, we will actually do a convolution where we have those cases with, I mean, variations of the functions in the middle. And we'll but just finish by this. I'm not sure even if we'll be able to cover the full example, but we'll try to do it and finish by this example. So <laughs> imagine that the input to your uh, system is the function x of t, which is given by a uh, constant value. And to simplify things, I'm going to do the following, OK? Uh, just as we go through, I'm just going to assume that we take capital T equals 1. So imagine that this does not exist. It makes things simpler. And this will become simply just 1, no T. And this will make it disappear. Okay, And this will just say 1, OK? So I'm, I'm not going to use the capital T, but then you can always generalize to a general width. So the width of the function, as in the graph here, is going to be 2. And the width of this one is going to be 2, rather than 2 capital T. OK? Hmm? No, I'm doing this to make the example simpler for you to understand. But in the exam, you have to solve what you are given. OK? I'm just doing this because we are trying to use the example now just for demonstrating something. But. Uh, you should be able to generalize, okay? So anyways, um, now the question is simply find the convolution between this function, x of t, and uh, h of t, which is the um, impulse response of the system. And notice that in these graphs, kind of the y-axis is misleading. So the zero point is here. So this function is actually uh, around, like it finishes at zero. And the same here, the zero point is here. So this is at the zero, OK? Sometimes the, the graph here has this shifted to minus 2, but this is where the zero is, OK? So in both cases, the functions are starting from zero and going up to time t equals 2, OK? And the question is to find the convolution of those. And let's start. So typically, what do we do? Again, I'm going to just eliminate those. Uh, capital T guys to make our life easier. And this will become one. OK. So the first thing we said that the x stays as is. So that's x of tau. The second function becomes h of t minus tau. And we draw it here for the general case, right? So we like uh, it will finish at the point t. It will start at the point t minus 2, right? Don't forget that it is time reversed and then shifted, OK? And here, we are showing in this graph particularly, we are showing the case of t is smaller than 0. So the shift is negative, right? In this case, we don't have any, two, any overlap between the two functions, right? Between the x and the h. So if you multiply them together, you should get zero, which means that the result of the convolution for t smaller than zero is equal to zero, right? Again, the graph here is what we used to draw like this. This is one function. This is the other function, right? And we are trying to solve x of tau, h of t minus tau, d tau, right? So we multiply those two. So we need to multiply this with this. For any t which is smaller than 0, right? if you multiply those two functions, this is multiplied by 0, this is multiplied by 0, the result of the multiplication is 0, which means that the result of this integral is 0, which means that the result of the convolution is 0. Correct? OK. Now let's try to think one more step. What will happen 
if the T is, and I want you, I don't know how to do this. Yeah, I know. I want you to look at this this way. Forget about the other limit. Okay? So when T is greater than or equal to zero, but we don't know where to stop yet. So just for the case, it's greater than or equal to zero. Okay? What will happen? We have here an example showing the two functions. The, the x of tau stays as is, so we don't really uh, have it. And uh, I can play the same trick here. So it's only two. And I will make this look like a one. Ah, nice. It worked. Okay. So this is x of tau as is. This is h of t minus tau, the flipped and shifted. And because the t is greater than 0, now we see that it should finish here at some positive value. So there is some overlap between the two functions, right? Don't lose focus. What are we trying to calculate? We are trying to calculate this, the integral of x of tau, h of t minus tau, d tau. So we're trying to do this multiplication and then calculate the integral of the result, right? Now, when we look at those two functions, we will find that they overlap only in this range, right? Correct? Mm -hmm. And outside this range, the dotted one, this one, is equal to zero here. So this whole part of the other function is multiplied by zero. And outside this point, this one is equal to zero. So this whole part of x of tau is multiplied by zero. So the only part where the multiplication does not result in a zero is only in this green range, right? Correct? Sahim ma'ya wala bitnamu. Okay. Okay. So if this is the case, then this means that my integral up there, which was from minus infinity to infinity, should be from where to where? Start point up to end point. So what's the start point? Zero. What is the end point? T, right? Yeah. Okay. And the values of the functions, this has a value equal to 1. This has a value equal to 2. So it's 1 times 2, which is this times this. And you integrate from 0 to T with respect to, and that's another mistake, D tau. Okay? You know how to solve this integral, right? Just constant, so it becomes 2 tau, and then you put the limits, so you end up with 2T. Okay. Now, here is the part that you have to be careful about. Is this situation with this expression true for any positive shift of t? Yeah. Why? Because as soon as you start shifting more and more, at some point, right, this part of the function, right, will overlap with some part of this function. And then you end up with two values overlapping with the dotted one, right? Two values from the solid one overlapping with the dotted one. So you cannot simply evaluate using only this single one times two integral, right? And when will this happen? As soon as this point reaches here, right? So when does this point reach here? This point is what? What's the value of this point? Time value of this one, one is what? T minus one. This is t, and the width here is 1. The width here is 1. You have dt minus 1. With d, this one is t minus 2. You got the idea? If we, if we call the leading edge t, then the one, one unit before it is t minus 1, and the other one, two units before it, as this moves, all of them, they move with it, right? The width stays the same, right? So this is t minus 1. And this is t minus 2. So the, over, the, the change of the expression will happen as soon as t minus 1 becomes 0. Ah. So as soon as this reaches this point, any further shift will cause two pieces to overlap with this, not only one piece, right? So this expression that we calculated is only valid up to, can I erase this? Yes. Up to t equals 1, right? When t moves until it reaches 1 here, this will move until it reaches here. And then any further shift, any value of t greater than 1, will cause two pieces to overlap with this. 
So we have to consider that in a separate case. Okay? This is clear to everyone? Okay. So, okay, we finish, we finish this, and we know that our end point for this expression is when t is equal to 1. Now we go to the next one. I also like to think about it without thinking with the upper limit until we need to calculate it. Now. Now? X axis is tau. Yes. Our uh, integration value. Okay. And the mistake I repeat here is d tau, d tau, not d, 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 d. <coughs> Okay. Let's look at that situation. Okay. When. Uh, one, one. Okay. So let's look at that situation when we exceed the one. So when t is greater than 1, when it passes this point, this point should be 1, not the capital T. Okay? Now what will happen in this case? As we said, there's going to be two pieces, two pieces of this function overlapping with this one, right? And I have to consider each one of them differently because the change of the value of the function will give me a different expression inside the integral. Still, my overall integration is from where to where? So I have from zero, the start of the overlap, until t, the end of the overlap, right? But the problem is, from this until this, I have a different value. And then from this until this, I have another different value, right? So I have to break this integral into two integrals added together. Right? What are those two integrals? The first one is from 0 up to this point. What's this point? The fact that it's minus t minus 1. Right? So from 0 to t minus 1, this is the t minus 1 point. Okay? And then the other one is from t minus 1 up to t. What are the values of the functions inside those two cases? For this case, it's 1 multiplied by 2, right? And for the other case, it is 1 multiplied by 3. And that's what we have here. The 1 multiplied by 3 and the 1 multiplied by 2. And then you solve the integrals. You get, again, this expression. I'd like to keep it without, uh, without t. So like this. Okay, it should be 1. Okay? You get this expression. And then the remaining part is I'm going to move. Uh, I mean, again, this is valid until what happens? At some point, right, this will reach the end here, right? And then the overlap is going to take a different situation because it's going to be not full overlap of this with this, but it's going to be partial from this one and full from the other one. So the limits of the integral will change. So I need to consider that case separately as well. Okay? So now this is going to be valid until I reach the point 2. Right? And then for the case that t is greater than 2 and less than 3, this is what's going to happen. I'm gonna have ah oh, we exceeded the point. Okay, I'm stopping. I'm gonna have the one times three happening from t minus two until t minus one. This expression t minus two until t minus one. The one times three, and then the one times two is happening from t minus one up to two on. From t minus one up to two on. Okay. And then the last part. So you move further, and t is greater than 2. So it starts, the end of this starts passing this point. Remember that we just, we are addressing the case of 2, no capital T. And this is just 1. Okay? <clears throat> so in this case, there is no overlap in this region from t up to 2, or from 2 up to t. 
Okay? There is an overlap from here to here. The star point here, we called it T minus 2, right? T is this point. In the middle here, it's T minus 1. In this point, it's T minus 2, okay? So the end, the star point of the overlap, right, is from T minus 2. And the end point of the overlap is just 2 because after that, there is 0 multiplied by this. And before that, there is zero multiplied by this. So the only part where you will have some non-zero multiplication is only from t minus 2 up to 2. So the integral goes from t minus 2 up to 2, but you have to divide it into two parts again because in one overlap, you have 3 multiplied by 1. And in another overlap here, you have 2 multiplied by 1. So you have to do two sectors of the integration. Again, just we are not considering the case of capital T. We're just considering a width of equal to two, right? Okay. And the result of the integral is going to be without any T. Just three, okay? So again, in those two regions, which is one from t minus two up to this point, which is t minus one. So from t minus two to t minus one, you have a value of one multiplied by a value of three. And then starting from this point, which is t minus one, up to the end point here, which is two, you have a value of one multiplied by a value of two, which is two. You solve this integral and this integral, you get the result that you see here. Okay, any questions so far? Because we are integrating, we want to integrate from here to here, right? From t minus 2 up to 2. This is the region of the overlap, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is, in the middle, the value of the functions change. So you cannot just write a single expression. You cannot use this only or this only. You have to consider the two different values of the function, right? What's inside the integral, the multiplication of the two functions, right? Here is one part, right, up to this point, and here is another part, this one. Okay, this is the total overlap region, right, from t minus 2 up to 2. In the yellow part, we have 1 multiplied by 3, and that yellow part is ranging from t minus 2 up to t minus 1, this part. Right? And then in the green part, starting from here, ending here, which is from t minus 1 up to 2. Okay? Any other questions? Yes? So if we took this is t, the one before it, the 2 is equal to t minus 1? Yeah, well, well the, this pulse, this uh, signal has a width of 1 and a width of 1. Right? So if this is t, then this point is t minus 1, and this point is t minus 2. Clear? Yeah, how do we know the, because the green part is between, it's like, it's not like, it's not here and it's not here. What do you mean not here and not here? The green part starts at this point in time, What's this? which is t minus 1. This is t, then this is t minus 1. Right? Yeah. Okay? And it finishes here, which is 2. So where is the problem? Okay, We are looking only for overlapping regions, right? So the overlapping region starts from here, finishes here. Well, but that overlapping region has two sectors. In one sector, we have this value. In the other sector, we have this value. So you just need to specify the region. Here from t minus 2 up to this, this is t minus 1. And then the next one starts from this, which is t minus 1, finishes up to this, which is 2. 
the expression of the, the function says that it is from t greater than. Okay. They didn't tell us. They actually gave us. It's going to be the small partial overlap with the higher with the higher. Part is actually when you go beyond, so t is greater than or equal t. Uh, th sorry, three. Again, I'll just remove the uh, capital T thing. Okay, and it's less than or equal. Uh, sorry, it's less than four. Whether you put the equal on one side or the other, just for mathematical correctness, you have to put the equal somewhere, and you should not repeat the equal. So it should not be here and in the previous region. Okay. You should not do that, okay? Um, again, our integrals are going to be from t minus 2 up to 2. And the result will not have a t. Let's get rid of this. Okay. So for this case, the case of t greater than or equal to 3, less than 4, there is only one single overlap region, this one. And the values of the start and the end point is t minus 2, and this point is 2, right? So this is t minus 2, okay? And the end point is 2, and the values of the signals in that region is 1, and the other one is 3. So 1 times 3 is 3, and then you integrate from t minus 2 up to 2, from t minus 2, this point, up to 2, this is the only overlapping region, right? The rest are uh, zeros multiplied by the other signal. So either zero from h multiplied by x or zero from x multiplied by h. This is the only region of overlap. The only region with the multiplication of the two signals is not going to be equal to zero. The multiplication in that case is going to be equal to three. And you integrate that, you end up with this expression. Okay? Last, when t is greater than and no overlap anymore, right? So these are the different cases. The result of this, 4, there is no overlap again. So if t becomes greater than 4, the two signals do not overlap, and you end up with 0, right? So the region where the signal, uh, the convolution will have a non-zero value is from t greater than 0 until t is less than 4, okay? And then after that and before that, the convolution is going to be equal to 0. It's going to be this final result that you have for the convolution. The convolution would look like this. That's the output from this system, okay? Next time, I'm going to do the last few steps again for you so we can revise. That's the result of the convolution. It's written here again in the general form if we use the signals with what width t instead of 0, 1, 2, and so on. I will like, keep it this way. But you know that the one that we solved does not have the t. The t is equal to 1. The capital T is equal to 1. Okay? That's the case that we solved because it's easier to vis visualize and not get confused with the symbols. Okay? Um, and this is the range where you have the convolution based on the equations that you deduce. So 0 here, and then from t greater than 0, less than 1, you have the 2t, and then from t greater than 1, less than 2, this situation, uh, right? You have the 2 plus 3t minus 1, and when t is greater than, greater than or equal to 2, less than 3, you have the 2 multiplied by 3 minus t plus 3, and so on. So these are the lines that corresponds to those equations in each section. Okay? That's the would look like as a function of time. Okay. So the whole idea here is just to get you to understand that when you are doing that convolution, you always have to visualize what's happening. Which function is flipped and how it's shifted, where are the regions of overlap, and if the function has this continuity, that if any of the two functions has those continuities, you have to observe when you move further with the shift, do you have more than one value of the function overlapping with the other, or it's always the same value overlapping, then you, you keep shifting. Whenever you have a change in one of the functions, you have to consider that in your integral, dividing that integral into pieces, right? So you have to keep that in mind, okay? Uh, 
uh, that's the whole idea of uh, doing this. Last but not least is interconnection of linear type invariant systems. Remember, I told you that we will address this at some point. I mentioned this at the start of the course, right? So I only consider two cases. The case of the looping feedback is a little bit more involved mathematically, so I omitted it out. So we are only considering series connections and parallel connections of linear time invariant system. If you have two or more linear time invariant systems connected in series or called cascade, the overall impulse response of the system is the result of the convolution of the series connection of the impulse responses, right? So, for example, here I have two connected in series, then the overall H of this resulting system is equal to the impulse response of the first convolved with the second. What if I had a third one? It would have been H1 convolved with H2 convolved with H3 and so on, okay? So when you connect in series, you simply convolve the impulse responses to get an overall input-output impulse response, okay? And when you connect in parallel, it's the addition, not the convolution. So the resulting impulse response of this system is the sum of the two impulse responses. And if there were three in parallel, it's going to be the sum of the three in parallel and so on. Okay? So that's how you can reduce interconnected system into a single equivalent impulse response, whether in the series case or in the parallel case. The feedback case is not considered in the scope of what we will do in this course. Any questions on this? How do you figure out this? You can actually start from the definition of the convolution and then call the intermediate signal here, for example, y1, and then you get y1 as a function of x of t, which is going to be x of t convolved with h1 of t, right? And then y1 is the input to this to get the next, which is the y. So the y is equal to y1 convolved with this. Then the overall is the input convolved with this, convolved with this to get the output. So then you can say that the equivalent of this is just simply the convolution of those two, right? I mean, you can do that easily. If I want to prove the first one, for example, it's going to be simply uh, call this, as I mentioned, call this y1 of t. Then you can write y1 of t is equal to x of t convolved with h of t, right? h1, sorry, of t, right? It's the output here, which is equal to the input convolved with the impulse response. And y of t is equal to whatever the input here, which is what I called y1 of t. So y1 of t convolved with this system, h2 of t. Substitute y1 from the first equation. So you can say that y of t is equal to y, uh, sorry, x of t convolved with h1 of t. This is y1, and then this whole thing is convolved with h2 of t, right? Okay. Now we know that convolution is has the associative property, right? So we can say that y of t is equal to x of t convolved with h1 of t convolved with h2 of t, right? From the associative property. This is the same as this. But now I can call this a new system, h equivalent, right, of t, which is convolved with x of t to give you the output. So that equivalent system is this guy, right? the output and how it relates to the input of the overall system. Then we know that this box is simply H1 convolved with H2, right? This shows you how you can actually deduce these. And the same you can do it for the parallel connection. It's a simple derivation using just the distributive. And in the second one, you will use, sorry, the associative. And in the second one, you will use the distributive property as well, okay? Any questions? Straightforward? I hope so. Uh, this is just a comic uh, on convolution. So convolution is typically a kind of an involved process. It requires lots of calculations and careful consideration of regions and so on. Um, so be careful. You need to practice doing it a few times 
in order to really minimize the chances that you will make a mistake. But still, even very experienced people, when they do calculations or convolutions, they can just miss a step or figure out a region incorrectly or whatever. So it's a little bit uh, challenging from that perspective. It doesn't really have deep concept behind it in terms of the calculation itself, but it has lots of calculations and considerations that you might miss. So this shows that students are always objecting to convolution and they go to the dean of engineering asking for bringing convolution down and stuff like that. So it's just a comic from the book. Uh, anyways, the key idea is you need to practice doing it a few times so that you can kind of capture the points where you make mistakes and try to avoid them in your future. Uh, okay, what, what are the mistakes and main mistakes? Like mostly figuring out the regions incorrectly. Mm -hmm. Or within a, a region, you multiply incorrect values of the functions. Sometimes that happens as well. Okay. Uh, with this, we are done with.